Okay, so my name is Marshall Kozloff. I am the Director of Outreach and Media for the Lincoln Network, and we're really super pumped to host everyone here for our uh, panel, The Tech Lash After COVID. Though, as anyone could guess, there have been sort of media and news events that have sort of changed the narrative of what we're going to focus on today. But I wanted to start with uh, introducing the panel and then switching it over to Terry Schilling, who at the American Principles Project is co-hosting this with us. So um, in descending order from my Zoom panel, we've got Matthew Feeney of the Cato Institute, uh, Alex Stapp at the Progressive Policy Institute, Matthew Schilling, American Principles Project, and Rachel Bovard of among many thing, other things, the Internet Accountability Project. Um, just quick note, not everyone on this panel is on the right. Like, this is a really sort of cool opportunity to sort of take a step back and like discuss like the broader ways that everything from sort of the debate about internet censorship to sort of big tech and the sort of power they wield, how we can approach that from sort of different perspectives. But I'll hand things over to Terry before we sort of go through the rest of the introductions. Uh, thank you so much, Marshall. Um, as uh, as you just said, uh, I am the executive director for American Principles Project, and uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, the moment uh, for our country is incredible. Uh, there's so much going on with the riots and with the coronavirus, um, and with big tech. And today, what we're hoping to do is have a discussion for how to address some of these issues when it comes to censorship and um, uh, lack, you know, blocking people's freedom of speech. Um, and, I, you know, there's a lot of policy proposals out there, and uh, we want to have a great discussion about it. But along with all those problems that we're facing with big tech, you know, we just had last week, uh, Twitter has announced that they're going to be fact-checking the president. Um, they haven't said whether or not they're going to fact-check his, uh, his political opponents, um, and they're just targeting him. So, you know, it raises questions, you know, who are, who are these censors? What is their political background? Do they have a political bias? Um, and do they have a right to have a political bias um, and, and be involved in censorship with a company that has millions and millions and millions of users? Um, ultimately, what uh, our interest is in this is expanding freedom of speech, expanding ideas, um, and allowing more people to offer uh, their ideas to this great American experiment. Our, our founders were such uh, great men, and uh, they they didn't want to empower elites uh, to tell us how to run our lives. They want to empower people. They 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 did something very odd, um, and they took a big risk, and that's why we're here today. And so we have great panelists. They're all respectable people, all very very smart. Some of them probably even smarter than me. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, anyway, uh, very excited to have this discussion, and, and we just really thank you guys for partnering with us on this. Yeah, so I think Terry sort of gave sort of a thesis statement for the way that APP is approaching this. So like, Rachel, let's go to you. You know, um, what, like, what, like, what's your role? Like, and what's your sort of approach for this sort of discussion in terms of uh, like Terry did? Yeah, so I'm coming at it kind of representing the group of conservatives that's concerned about the growing power of big tech. Um, you know, lately this has been, you know, just a Section 230 discussion, but our concerns are much broader than that. Um, you know, we want private industry to flourish, but when private industry takes a growing role over everything from speech to market access to individual privacy, um, you know, to elections, like those things have policy consequences. And so um, the right isn't monolithic on these questions. So that's kind of what I'm here to discuss. Great. Matthew? Uh, yeah, so I focus on issues associated with emerging technologies and, and civil liberties at the Cato Institute so that uh, involves a lot of work on law enforcement technology. So I've done work on facial recognition, drones, body cameras, those kind of things. But more and more, I think uh, speech issues are at the forefront of a lot of the emerging technology debates. And uh, my, uh, my, my take on this um, is uh, pretty typical of a uh, free market liberal, which is I want there to be a entrepreneurial and innovative uh, tech sector in the United States. I worry that complaints from the left and the right about how some of these big prominent firms are behaving actually risks being anti-competitive in the long run, hampering speech in the long run, growing the size of government and uh, making it harder for the market to function. Great, now Alec. Hey, I'm the uh, Director of Technology Policy at the Progressive Policy Institute. We're a center left think tank in DC, um, working with moderate Democrats to advance our policy goals. And I come at it from a similar perspective uh, to Matthew in terms of wanting to see the tech, tech sector operate on free market principles. Um, where I might differ from Matthew is our think tank often sees more market failures, more opportunities for 
government intervention to improve the status quo, uh, as well as the need for uh, redistribution uh, in, case the, in cases where the market outcomes are very unequal and don't necessarily provide a, a safety net for people. Um, so that's kind of, kind of our approach, uh, how, to, how we do things. Yeah, so we're jumping into it. Um, I tweeted from Lincoln's account earlier that we're going to solve all these issues in the next hour. Um, so I'm excited to do that. Um, and just a quick note for the participants, um, please add your questions to the queue. Um, basically, depending on how the conversation goes, we'll spend the last 15 to 20 um, asking, um, having the panelists respond. If you have a specific question for a specific panelist, like make sure to like, put their name in it so we don't just throw it to everyone. But yeah, jumping in, I think the big issue we have here is that all these sort of tech policy issues have been intertwined with the culture war. Um, so I think the biggest issue, Terry, when you talk about censorship is that I, I very much understand where you're coming from, but I could easily see people on the left and the center saying putting a fact check on things relating to elections like, you know, Jack Dorsey did isn't censorship. So could I get everyone starting a few hours specifically, like what is censorship um, in this context, do you think? Uh, that's a great question. I think uh, this is where I, I think I might have some kind of sympathy for uh, our, our friends on the uh, conservative movement who want to see some kind of more action on tech, because I think that in this debate, I often see that legal terms and layman's terms get conflated and kind of confused in the discussion. So I think that uh, when you see things like what is a public forum, uh, it's my understanding based on what legal experts tell me on the case law, that you, it's really tough uh, based on current uh, interpretation to say what that these big tech platforms, even no matter how big they are, they're not uh, protected as, as, as public fora, and therefore they don't uh, have any kind of First Amendment obligation uh, to their users. Um, but the platforms themselves have First Amendment protection to moderate their, con their content the way they see fit. Um, and they have obviously Section 230 protections. So they don't take on liability when they do that kind of moderation. Uh, but I think that there's, there's the First Amendment understanding of these terms. Uh, there's the public fora legal definition, but there's also people's understanding like, well, a lot of speech happens in this place in the same way that in public places, a lot of speech happens. Um, uh, there's a, there's a the concept of free speech as distinct from the First Amendment, just more speech uh, being available to people is better. And so I think that uh, in this debate, often these things get conflated. And I think that the way I look at it in terms of what Twitter did in censorship is the idea that, well, this platform didn't exist uh, a few decades ago and there was no way to access uh, people sharing their opinions directly without going through um, gatekeepers and authoritative channels. So I think in general, it's obviously expanded speech. Um, and then it makes sense when there's some kind of algorithm doing the sorting that there needs to be some kind of um, pushback in terms of labeling content um, or limiting it in some way. Uh, and we can obviously debate the merits of that. Yeah, feel free to jump in if anyone has some immediate thoughts. Um, yeah, I, I would uh, agree that we shouldn't uh, confuse uh, our legal terms with, with layman or conceptual terms, but I think that they're, um, they're nonetheless important. Um, so censorship, uh, is usually a, a word attributed to usually um, government removal or banning of certain kinds of, of speech. Uh, it, it can be applied, of course, to, to, to private companies, um, but I think it's important we understand uh, free speech as a association right, that uh, people should be free to associate with whatever speech uh, they find appropriate, whether they're individuals or a private company like Twitter. Uh, I think the word censorship in the context you raised it is, is inappropriate. Um, I mean, a fact check is not uh, censorship. I mean, I'm sure during this discussion, uh, Alec Perry or, or Rachel will disagree with something I've said, um, but that doesn't mean they're censoring me. Um, if I say that two plus two is five, and then someone says, no, actually it's four, that's not an act of censorship. So I don't think Twitter's fact checking of the president should be considered censorship in that way. So I would add that yeah. I think that the legal you know, distinctions here are obviously extremely important, but the cultural ones are as well. And I would just point to the fact that, you know, according to Pew Research, 72% of the public thinks, and this is a quote, that it's likely that social media platforms actively censor political views that those companies find objectionable. So whether or not, you know, this is, this is a legal distinction, but it's also a clear cultural one. Everyone across the, the country thinks these companies do this. Um, you know, whether or not fact checking is or is not censorship as a legal matter doesn't prevent it from having significant consequences to our elections. I mean, all, a lot of our political discourse happens on Twitter, it happens on Facebook, uh, and we get a lot of our content through Google. These are the three major platforms that dominate our discourse. And so if, if Twitter wants to go ahead and light itself on fire as the arbiter of truth in our political discourse, I welcome it because I appreciate the scrutiny it's going to bring right down on their heads. 
Yeah, it's an interesting uh, poll. I mean, I'm surprised it's not 100%. I, I thought you know, man, everyone <laughs> understands that these, uh, these companies have content moderation policies and there's plenty of legal First Amendment protected activity that is not allowed on a lot of these, uh, a lot of these, uh, these platforms. So uh, footage of beheadings or animals being crushed to death, pornography, these are all uh, legal pieces of content that the most prominent firms take steps to remove. And, and that's, of course, a wise business choice. And I think Rachel's raising an interesting question, which is uh, what the actual business implications might be of this, which is that Twitter uh, loses uh, market share because it is um, engaging in this kind of fact checking. Um, one, I mean, it's a difficult um, issue, I think, for Twitter to apply consistently. I mean, the problem is that, uh, look, I, all politicians engage in a bit of dishonesty, but I think Trump is in a league of his own when it comes to the degree to which he misleads uh, and lies about uh, policy and uh, a range of other things. Uh, however, you know, is it possible that uh, Trump supporters will leave Twitter and go to something else? That, that's possible, and actually many of them have done that, and that's something I think we should welcome. Um, the, the fact is that content moderation is very, very difficult. There's no way for any company dealing with hundreds of millions of pieces of content to do this consistently. Um, so we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here, though, I think, when looking at content moderation. If I could just tag on there real quick, because I think there's a really important thing that in this debate often we, mi we mix together the idea that you can, of criticism of the platforms and their behavior, and then that automatically assuming that that needs a policy response or some kind of policy response to make the status quo better. And I think a, a helpful analogy here is the situation around YouTube and quote unquote radicalization and the way that the algorithm was recommending content over time. Uh, there's a lot of conflicting reports on, on evidence of this happening, but I'm genuinely persuaded that this was actually a, a, a significant problem three or four years ago based on what they're optimizing for in terms of engagement and the idea that you just show someone a little edge of your content over and over. Maybe you're actually influencing the content they see and how they act. And there was lots of news coverage of this, tons of podcasts. Everyone was paying attention to this and uh, being critical of YouTube for potentially facilitating this. And they changed the algorithm. And all the evidence I've seen in the last one to two years is that this problem has basically, basically been fixed. And so that's a situation where there was public scrutiny, uh, private action by the company, for a problem that most people agreed was potentially a problem and it didn't require any uh, new law or legislation legislation so we've teed this up for you terry so we need to get the response <laughs> yeah so look I, I guess that my problem with the, look i think that censorship is um it's i have a broader uh use of it and i think that while we all have the right to, of freedom of association and assembly um you know there are obviously limits to that <laughs> Um, and we decided with uh, passing civil rights laws that, you know, there are certain things that you can't uh, base freedom of association on. Um, and, and I totally accept that. And I think that uh, we're now facing not as, uh, as uh, critical as, a, as an issue as we did in the 50s and 60s, but um, we are talking about limiting the freedom of speech of certain people because we politically disagree with them. Now, when it comes to the fact checking of President Trump, um, my issue is, is that who, who determines what the facts are? I know who determines what the facts are, and it's the people. Um, you know, if you can come out with a, a report, for example, that comes from the Heritage Foundation on the same exact topic, analyzing the same exact numbers, is going to be very different than a report that comes out of Brookings. And I think that we need to be very careful, and I think that these big companies should always err on giving both sides of the story. So, for example, President Trump was fact-checked on uh, criticizing the mail-in balloting system and how it's open to intimidation and voter fraud, which is absolutely a fair criticism and concern to have about this process. Uh, we've seen in California that the mail-in balloting system has been greatly abused. Um, intimidation tactics, ballot chasing, uh, harvesting. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions that be, should, be, should be asked about this. And for, for Twitter to get involved in this and try and tell us exactly what the facts are, one, I think we should know who these fact checkers are, um, if they're donating to political candidates, if they have a certain ideology. Um, and look, I think that Facebook for a lot of this has been a great player in this. They put together councils and the councils are represented by a diverse group of people. I wish they had more conservatives on board. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, if you're gonna do the fact checking, you have to have an equal amount of conservatives, independents, and uh, uh, progressives on board with it. Otherwise, you're just gonna have a propaganda machine that is serving as a political weapon uh, for a political party. Rachel, I'm gonna um, 
add a critique for Matthew and Alex, and I'd love for you to sort of jump on because I think it'll be up like sort of alley in the area you focus on. I when I hear talk about sort of like people could choose to go other platforms or the debate is about market share, it seems to be sort of missing the point because I think the real and this is sort of why the culture war dynamic is like really tough because like you could say, okay, yes, like conservatives could go to places other than Twitter and other than Facebook, but like as anyone knows, like those are places that are pretty quickly captured by like weird like antisocial people, right? Like there's a lot more like weird white nationalists on like a platform like Gab than there are on Twitter. And like that prevents it, so that presents an issue. And part of the issue here, and this goes to the critique that Rachel makes, is that if we don't discuss this conversation about the public square when factoring in the sort of the, the, the power that these platforms actually have, if we don't talk about the network effects that they use to make leaving the platforms more difficult, um, it seems like we're not really leaving anyone anywhere to go. So like to Alec, when you were talking about how, hey, like we could solve problems that don't require government intervention, I think it was a great, the, the usage of the radicalization was like a great one. Because that's, some, that's not a culture war issue though, I think. Like that's an issue where most people agree that like radicalization and like, that's bad. Like that's, that's not controversial. But when it comes to these things like fact checking, when it comes to things like, my less that less but I think the issue is that when there's a lack of trust that doesn't work so the issue people have is that people don't think a president Joe Biden is going to be fact-checked in the way that a president Trump is going to be fact-checked but I'd love for you to sort of like interject on that line Rachel if you have anything yeah I mean I think it really does get to whether or not you know there's a, a refusal to acknowledge that these companies play a role in the public square you know as a legal matter and that's fine but from a cultural perspective they do it is where our political speech happens Facebook, you know, acknowledges as much. In a leaked memo, they acknowledge the fact that they can swing elections, that they claim they got Donald Trump elected, they can unelect him the next day. Those things have consequences and ramifications that we need to be talking about. And in terms of, you know, being able to go to another platform, you know, Twitter has no near-term competitor. Um, you know, fa maybe Facebook does. If they do, they'll just buy them. Um, so, you know, we're seeing a huge amount of antitrust scrutiny over Google for the same question. And by and large, you know, a lot of the examples people use is, oh, well, look at MySpace, it existed and then it didn't. But that was a totally different, uh, I think, substantive example because what you're dealing with right now is how people gather and where debate happens. You know, like it or not, journalists are on Twitter. I would love to get off Twitter. It's a dumpster fire. I think it's like existentially <laughs> depressing half the time, especially right now. But it's, it's how you shape narratives. It's how you communicate to people in power. And that matters. Um, you know, I don't want to see you know, these companies regulate out of existence, but I do think these are important public policy questions. And I think more to the point, you know, consumers also don't have a lot of transparency about how these companies make these decisions. That was one of the interesting things about Trump's executive order. You know, the Section 230 element of it aside, um, the transparency was interesting to me because we don't know. We're supposed to just take these companies' word for it that, oh, they're, you know, they just, they're not politically you know, activist in any way. You know, we don't know their rules for content moderation, their enforcement techniques, how they demote and delay content, the technical terms they tell their algorithms to use. You know, if they want to win confidence on this point, they should make that clear. Let the researchers in, let the sunlight in on these questions. I'll just jump in to respond to Marshall, to your point about the radicalization questions. I think that it's actually not that distinct from a culture war issue, because I, I recall during that debate, that a lot of people were describing certain uh, political commentators as kind of a gateway to the alt-right and to more fringe communities um, in right-wing circles. And so like I think of Jordan Peterson, I think his face was on the New York Times front page story about YouTube radicalization. And the idea was like, uh, if you promote him in the algorithm, then people that are promoted off of Jordan Peterson are like really objectionable. And I think people on the right were often critical that though if, if it, YouTube were to fix this issue by changing the algorithm, it would negatively affect certain right-wing of right, right -wing voices. And so I think they're not necessarily as distinct as those, those might be. Um, and then to, to Rachel's point about YouTube, or sorry, about Facebook versus Twitter, I think one, it's important to keep scale in mind here. So Twitter has around 300 million uh, worldwide monthly active users. Uh, Facebook has 2.6 billion mon monthly active users worldwide. So one is you know, about 10x scale of the other. Of the other. Uh, and it's really interesting that we're, as we're having this debate that Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg are publicly feuding about what the appropriate policy is. And they've basically taken divergent approaches. And so back to Matthew's point earlier about like how this can be solved with choice and, and users moving around. Uh, I think if, in terms of how you spend what portion of your time on each platform, like you don't have to quit or one completely or leave it. Um, you could just spend less time or kind of endorse Mark or Jack's uh, um, approaches with your time. It is interesting to think about the, the, the role of these companies. I mean, I, well, 
I'll leave it to my peers to decide whether I live something kind of like a normal life. But, you know, I don't have a, a Facebook account. Um, it is possible to live something like a, a life without these things. Um, and, and to Rachel's point, you know, yeah, I do think, look, a lot of these uh, companies and the services they offer might not be conducive to a lot of um, public commentary and debate. Um, however, you know, on the point of choice, I think there is, there is choice out there, but look, it, you'd be naive to d deny that YouTube, Google, and, and Twitter, Facebook are the biggest ones. But at the core, I think it's important to remember that the First Amendment is a protection against government action. These are private companies. And, uh, you know, this, the, the analogy of this as a public forum, I think, is, is misguided, um, if only because... Uh, you don't get to impose yourself into someone else's private property. If if it is true, look, I, I mean, to Terry's point, um, if Twitter decided, look, our goal is to fact check Republicans, um, they lie more than Democrats, so we're just going to engage in this and we won't fact check Joe Biden, uh, they should be allowed to do that. Um, and it would be a bad business decision in the long run because they'd lose a lot of conservative users who would go to an alternative. Uh, but what, what I find somewhat frustrating about this, this debate is I, I wish that a lot of people who were com complaining about a lot of how these... Um, platforms are, are moderating content would focus more of their energy onto building something new. And I would like to see something new. Um, on the anti-competitive point, I, I think it's it's sometimes lost on um, people that, that the, these firms actually are competing with each other. Um, and so I think the antitrust uh, component won't work. Um, but, but look, this is just, a, I suppose, more of a, a left-wing critique of, of big tech. Uh, these companies are under attack from the left and the right. Um, so as someone who isn't exactly a huge fan of, a, of, of, these, of a lot of what these companies do, I, I nonetheless would uh, hope we don't regulate them too much because I worry about regulatory capture. I, I just want to jump in here real quick um, because I, I, I've talked to a lot of people about this. And the point that I make, because we're involved in trying to regulate pornography online, we think it's just out of control. And what I compare it to is the Industrial Revolution, uh, which was obviously the greatest advancement in economic uh, output of all time. Um, the industrial revolution comes along, you have all these factories that are literally dumping their, their excess and their pollution into our rivers. They're putting uh, pollution into our air. People are getting sick, they're getting cancer. And at that time, it was a real debate. You know, these are private companies. They own the land they're on. They own that part of the river. And, you know, do we, does government actually have a role? And at that time, we said, yeah, of course, because it's affecting everyone else. And at the same time, I think that with the invention of the internet, we've gone through a probably an even bigger revolution in an in information revolution, um, in a communications revolution. It has, it has impacted the world much greater than the industrial revolution has. Um, and right now, we're dealing with how to handle it. And that's what this entire debate is. There, right now, I would compare pornography to pollution being put into our streams and into our airways. Uh, I would view, uh, you know, these guys censoring us as pollution that we have to figure out how to deal with. Um, the thing is, is that this, we have to remind ourselves, this is the public square. It's the public square. There's no getting around it. The internet should be just like our society. And there should be no difference, right? So like the same laws that we accept in the real world and the physical world for brick and mortar stores should be applied to the internet. And if you're gonna open up a, a, a place where people can come and discuss ideas, it should be held to first amendment standards and obscenity standards. You should be able to, look, I, I think you should be able to restrict people uh, for obviously racist content. There are certain rules that you can have, but look, and, and here's the thing, what we do at APP, is we, always, we don't just try and complain about things. We come up with a policy solution that we think is a middle ground that both people can, can agree to, both sides can agree to. And with our Section 230 reform that we've come up with, it, it, it basically uh, acknowledges that the internet's a public square uh, and it's a platform. And it gives people the opportunity to either one, reduce their size to be not too dominant in the market, um, to either face liability or three, adhere to the public square rules. Um, that's our model legislation. It's out there. Um, I haven't really seen any legitimate criticism of it, but I don't know. I, I, I just view this in a totally different way. I think that we need to be bold. I think that we need to be not afraid to use the political power that the American people have given us to come up with solutions. And I, cause I think they want solutions. And I think that that's why people get disillusioned with politicians and, and public policy officials because we don't use the power that they give us. Oh, um, I would just want to just just quickly um, on on that. So okay, um, 
I get so so a lot of people are upset about pornography, and we can have a debate about the the negative effects of, of porn. But um, keep in mind, any power that uh, a conservative group could use to to amend the law to restrict uh, the spread of pornography is uh, the same kind of hammer that the left could use against gun owners. Uh, in fact, some of the most prominent critics on the, the political left of Section 230 point to websites like Arms List that allow for the private sales of firearms as the kind of behavior um, that isn't appropriate for Section 230 protection. Um, so just be wary that uh, in a campaign uh, against pornography, you risk um, some collateral damage there. Um, and, and secondly, I. I suppose well, look, I, I we should the, try and, the, sorry, if I could just, just quickly, just, I, I do want to hear your response yeah. to that, but, but just very quickly, um, I think it's important to keep in mind what kind of um, a consistency in the argument, because on the one hand, you're saying we should have a public square, which enjoys First Amendment protection, but on the other hand, you're saying, well, we should have the same rules for brick and mortar stores, and, and brick and mortar stores are totally free to eject people who are using uh, language that they disagree with, uh, and so I, I don't see those Not two as compatible. a public platform. Well, but this is so again, this well, is I know uh, we decided at the beginning that the legal and conceptual definitions are confusing, but I think that is important because I'd like to understand your position. But so if so look, we obviously distinguish between platforms and publishers, right? And publishers are obviously liable because guess what? They, they edit the content. And right now, uh, it's very obvious that these social media uh, platforms uh, are trying to have it the best of both worlds. Now regarding pornography and restricting this, uh, look, uh, there are already group like laws on our books that restrict obscene material. There are the sec yeah, I forget the section of the law right now, but there are laws that say you can't transmit obscene material to minors. You can't transmit it across state lines. You can't transmit it through the mail. There are lots of restrictions and we've had laws that everyone agreed to, right? So we, we obviously tell, uh, porn stores, uh, Hey, you can't open up next to a school. You can't open next to a church. You have to go all the way to the really bad end of town. And by the way, if you get caught selling and providing any obscene material to minors, you're going to jail and we're shutting you down. Now, somehow or another, with this information revolution, our courts and uh, our elected officials have refused to show any type of political uh, will to, to have the same standards that we all as a society agree on. That's what society is, right? That's what our laws are. It's us coming together and agreeing on what's acceptable and what's not. And so somehow or another, the porn shops, the brick and mortars, they don't, they'll get shut down if they provide it. But browsers or YouPorn or, uh, you know, Pornhub, they get to, not only do they not verify the age of people consuming their obscene material, they don't even verify the age of people uploading it. So we have actually uncovered 15 year olds uploading their own porn videos. Now who's liable for that? Because right now Pornhub's not liable for anything because it was uploaded by the user. How is a 15 year old held liable for posting their own pornography? It, these guys are profiting off of this and we need to rein them in. Sorry, I, 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 I like to talk about porn. Yeah, like regulating no, it anyway. no, no, no worries. Um, so I, I guess the question for Alec and Matthew then, um, I think Terry's doing a great job of bringing up sort of the way the conversation around these platforms and the internet in general has changed since 1996 when section 230 happened, when we had this sort of discussion. So are there any reforms or changes, right? So that, that you guys think, are there any lessons we've sort of learned over the past 15 to 20 years? So I think that example of what do we do if a 15 year old uploads content to this platform? What do we do if there are these very clear examples of platforms where speech is mostly trending towards? Are there any, I don't want to even say concessions, but are there any sort of changes that you think we should make? Um, well, once again, this is that. a law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, the problem for me is that the main thing on the table that both PC on the left and right is that revoking Section 230 is, is the main avenue to solve this problem. And I think it would, it would do more harm than good because that law allows companies, incentivizes them to moderate their content. That's why they have community standards. The biggest ones, Facebook and Twitter, have community standards against all the kind of co the content we're, we're talking about here. And I think part of what gets confused in this debate is the stakes of, of revoking 230 and what would happen to these companies. Uh, I would argue that it would basically make their current business model um, unviable. And if they're liable for content posted by their users, uh, they just, they won't be able to survive in any kind of, kind of their current state. And so I think it's the, it's the death of social media. And on the right, you see uh, figures like Senator Hawley and others who want to empower the FTC to enforce some kind of neutrality provision um, and make, platforms liable if they're not being neutral or fair or, you know, adhering by public square standard. And I think uh, that's 
trying to assume there's no trade-off here that they can, we can just get more speech, fair speech with, with no cost. But I think the companies will run into so much liability that they won't be able to operate as social media platforms and we'll just lose all the speech we currently have. And I would contrast that with certain commentators like Matt Iglesias on the left, uh, Michael Brennan Doherty on the right. And I think they're more clear-eyed about the trade-offs. And they say, like Michael Brennan Doherty had a tweet last week about how uh, Facebook takes public liable and slander and turns it into private profit for its own gain. And he just believes that the business model is, is, is incorrect and, and, and immoral in a sense. And to Terry's analogy to pollution, he's saying that there's so much pollution in the public discourse that it erodes our institutions um, and it's just toxic that it's worth revoking Section 230, any other kind of protections you think disproportionately benefit tech platforms. And if they shut them down, they shut them down. And Matt Iglesias also talks about like research showing that Facebook does more harm than good in terms of like um, mental health or social well well-being. And so he's just saying like, it's a bad company and I I'd rather not see it. And so that's like a clear eyed trade off of like, we're gonna lose the good speech with the bad speech and people can disagree about um, the net, how that, those things net out. So can I just- would, uh, uh, Please go ahead. Yeah, right. yeah, Rachel. Who's actually suggesting revoking section 230? Who is Sorry? introduced? Who's actually suggesting revoking 230? I believe, oh, well, I believe Joe Trump Biden had, no, and Trump Donald Trump, Trump both did. Yeah, Trump they had said revoke 230. No, right, but they can't, right? Like what leg the legislature has to do that. And so I'm, right. I'm asking what bills are there to do this? Because a lot of this time, I think this, this gets put into this binary framing that like it's, it's two, all of 230 or none of 230. And that's, I don't think what any of, those, these legis any of this legislation is suggesting at all. It's suggesting reforming mm. 230 or updating it. Now we can say, well, this, might, this is gonna burn down the internet and usually that's the response. But we've done it before. We've amended 230 before. And I know a lot of you disagreed with that at the time, but we did it in 2018. The internet is still working. And so I guess I just think our conversations around this issue should be a little bit more precise. Um, um, Section 230, and I know, Matthew, you've taken issue with this in the, paper, in the Medium post that you wrote, but to your point, the point that Alec just made, it is central to tech's business model. Tech cannot exist without this government protection. In effect, it is an implicit federal subsidy to tech. And that's not my framing. That's... Eric Goldman's framing, and he's arguing that it needs to be, right? We need to keep it that way. But, you know, he's the most probably prolific and respected pro-230 person out there, and he even acknowledges that it's a subsidy. So I think what Congress is doing is saying, look, we, we gave this, uh, we need to review it. This is a 26-year-old statute that doesn't necessarily reflect the modern internet. So I think when we talk about this, we need to not say, no one's suggesting revoking 230, who can actually do it? You should talk okay, to Trump well, about that. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so there, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Look, I, I, I do think that uh, look, even people on my side um, can fall into a trap of of believing that you know um, we, we we treat the mag section two thirty like the Magna Carta of the internet. Look, it's a law. It can be amended. It's been amended before. Um, I would say you know um, the the data is conflicting of the effect of SESTA Foster, but I think it actually. Um, did, did harm uh, a, a lot of people. And that's a whole separate debate we can have. Um, to Terry's point, um, I don't think it's legal um, to upload uh, pornography of 15 year olds. And um, the person responsible for that content is the person who does the uploading. I mean, central to 230 is the, the radical idea that people are responsible for what they say and what they do on the internet. Um, and one other thing uh, that I would like to, to stress is we, uh, the internet's bigger than Silicon Valley and it's bigger than social media. Section 230, I think, is discussed a lot in the context of Twitter and Facebook, but it protects firms that aren't involved in the social media business at all. And it protects uh, companies and interactive computer services, big and small. Um, and I appreciate that more and more, actually, um, I forget the author, but there was a piece in um, The Federalist and uh, I disagreed with almost all of it, but what, something that I did like about it was that the author embraced the notion that, yeah, look, if, if um, but maybe social media should just be burnt to the ground. Like maybe this has just been a massive mistake. Um, I don't buy that. Um, but I think people should actually focus more on where 230 came from, why it was written. Uh, it didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, and look, maybe social media is horrible. Maybe the modern internet's horrible and we can build something better. But we shouldn't pretend that uh, amending section 230 wouldn't have serious effects on the amount of speech we see on the internet. So we're um, five minutes out from taking questions. So I think We've hit a lot of things and actually Neil Chilson in the comments pointed out that like we should we keep try to be a little more precise when we talk about the internet. All that being said, I want to give everyone the chance to sort of make like a closing statement like and basically frame it as sort of like, okay guys, like what are our takeaways, right? We're moving deeper into 2020. Mm -hmm. Something's clearly going to happen in 2021. Like what are our takeaways and how we should be approaching these issues? Let's start with you, Terry. Mar Marshall, could I start that off? Yeah. Um, so just just in, uh, I just want to respond to the the idea that you know it's illegal and, it, and the liability falls on the 15 year old. 
it's kind of it reminds me of uh you know there's an episode of the office where michael the manager michael scott uh forwards a very offensive uh email to the entire uh office and he says well you would i just i didn't write the email i just forwarded it along um you would never you know arrest someone for forwarding drugs um <laughs> look pornhub is hosting this they're making a lot of money on it and there's liability there um you know you don't get to say well the 15 year old uh, first of all 15 year olds can't even consent so i don't even know how you would prosecute them um but they're profiting off of it they do nothing they're irresponsible we, we also the thing that we don't that a lot of people forget is that our law punishes uh neglect and when you act as an irresponsible player so if you don't do due diligence uh to to keep uh 15 year old pornography off the internet you're liable for it and you shouldn't be held liable for it but right now they're hiding under section 230 and lots of other laws and we should be enforcing it but I, look i think that this is a, a lively debate i absolutely love it um and um i i think that there's a lot more to discuss and i'm looking forward to getting to the question yeah rachel how about you so you know i think this is an important a debate and I think efforts to shut it down or dismiss it are misguided. Um, this is a, you know, like I said in the beginning, the power of these tech companies is unprecedented. Um, it's not, it's not just speech, right? It's, it's a whole other area. It's data privacy, it's behavior, it's elections, it's market access. And this idea that somehow the tech lash is over, um, I think is just patently untrue. And you can look at any number of areas uh, from the robust antitrust enforcements going on at the state and local or state and federal level, um, you know, to, kind of the t Twitter inserting itself in the political debate and I think the policy ramifications that that's going to have on them. And so I really do think as conservatives, like, you know, when did we stop being concerned about, for instance, small business getting, you know, shut down by, by sort of corporate behemoths? When did we stop that? You know, that's a bit, that should be a concern. When did we stop caring about, you know, the power social media has to compel behavior in, in, in elections? When did we stop caring about that? So these are things I think that, that should be discussed. I think, um, you know, trying to, to, to push it into a, a pro big government or, or pro small government is, is not a correct framing. Um, there are legitimate concerns on both sides and good arguments on both sides. And so um, I thank you kind of for putting this together because I think this is the debate we're going to be having uh, in the future. Yeah, Matthew. Um, yeah, this might be an issue actually where um, I, I like to think I'm usually a, an optimistic, cheery person, but I, um, from, from a, a classical liberal like me, I think that uh, these these companies are on the receiving end of criticism from the left and the right, and uh, I'm I'm sure that the creative minds on Capitol Hill will figure out some way to square their holes and to to come up with some kind of change. Uh, we saw this uh, in the debate with uh, Sester Foster that was uh, discussed earlier. So I, I am actually a little gloomy about the prospect that there could be significant change to internet regulation uh, in the coming year or two. Uh, and uh, what I worry about there is that it means ultimately more powerful market incumbents and less uh, less speech on on the internet. Um, and and I hope that, that yeah anyone watching this uh, reads uh, the Eric Goldman that, that Rachel noted earlier um, and the, the plethora of really good commentary out on this um, from, from from all sides uh, because it's not a debate that's going anywhere. Uh, but I think it is important to to highlight the fact that uh, Section uh, two hundred and thirty is is often uh, misunderstood, whether it's the publisher uh, platform distinction, uh, also noting that it doesn't cover uh, criminal, uh, federal criminal uh, acts uh, to, to Terry's 15 year old uh, porn uh, comment earlier. But uh, I, I view this as just a, one of many conversations we're going to be having in uh, the next year or two. But ultimately, I'm not actually that optimistic. Say something cheery, Alec. Make us, make I'll us try. feel good. <laughs> I'll try my best. Uh, so I think, I think it's important to, uh, also, maybe not something cheery, but something about how important this debate is. It makes all feel uh, uh, like we're doing something worthwhile here. So I think this, the stakes, we shouldn't underrate the stakes of this, of this debate. Um, and to Rachel's point, I think it's just really important to note that the leader of the Republican Party uh, has explicitly said that we should revoke Section 230 and that the reason he took limited action in the executive order is because he felt constrained by the law and that he couldn't just obviously provoke himself because she's correct that he does need congressional action to do so. But that's his desire. He's the leader of um, one of the two largest parties in the country. And the leader, Joe Biden, of the other largest party in the country has said in a New York Times interview that he would like to have Section 230 withdrawn immediately. And so they're both leaders of the party and that could definitely uh, portend future congressional action. Uh, and as far as bills that have already been introduced in the legislature, Senator Hawley's bill that would make uh, liability immunity contingent upon uh, FTC bureaucrats 
uh, approving you a, a license on an annual or biannual basis that your platform is neutral and unbiased. Um, that seems like a weird solution coming from a, a quote unquote conservative, but if that's the alternative to revoking 230, I guess it is better in a way. Um, and then to just disagree with um, some of my friends on the pro 230 side of the debate, I do think it's a mistake to emphasize too much how, how this applies to small uh, businesses. Because I think that while of course 230 applies based on conduct and not who you are, it's based on whether you moderate um, or are the speaker of, of the content, uh, it's clearly just more beneficial, like like Eric Goldman says, uh, certain business models wouldn't exist without it. And so if you know you revoke 230, I believe that Wall Street Journal would shut down its comment section, but the Wall Street Journal wouldn't cease to exist. If you revoke 230 and not replace, and don't replace it with any kind of community, I think Facebook and other platforms would essentially cease to exist or look unrecognizable um, from their current state. So I think the, the stakes really matter and it's important. Um, and that wasn't very cheery. <laughs> No worries. Um, and actually, before we just some questions, the last sort of question is, I'd like everyone to sort of make a prediction, and Matthew, you sort of hit at this, for how we think this space is going to evolve over the next year, because sort of the original thought with this panel was, hey, like, there were all these conversations, antitrust, 230, privacy, and then COVID happened, right? And you had all the sort of things happening at tech companies. So do we think we're going to basically be in the same exact space, having these same exact arguments, in June of 2021, which is sort of what I suspect to sort of editorialize my moderator position. Um, so Terry, just quick prediction, are we going to be here in the same space in 2021? Yeah, because, uh, you know, look, uh, the law in order to be changed has to either have compromise between uh, the, the Republicans and Democrats, and we obviously have a split uh, Congress right now, um, or, uh, you know, one party has to take over both chambers and have the presidency. So it's very likely that we'll be in this position in uh, 2021. But I think that within the next five years, uh, I'm very optimistic. I think that in the next five years, we're going to be able to get a lot done. I think that we're going to be able to protect kids from porn. You know, 11 year olds have, with a smartphone, have access to some pretty uh, uh, obscene material. Um, uh, but we're going to be able to protect kids uh, from obscene material. We're going to be able to protect people's First Amendment rights. We're going to have a bigger, better, uh, more American internet, and it's going to be beautiful. Rachel. Um, oh. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, what's, I actually think a lot of where we end up depends on the result of these antitrust investigations. Um, I actually think a lot of the concerns that we have, particularly regarding speech and data privacy, are actually downstream from antitrust. A lot of these concerns, I think, could actually be competed away uh, if we had a free market in tech that addressed you know, the antitrust investigations are addressing the sort of ad tech component that I think drives a lot of, you know, compulsory use of these platforms. To Matthew's point where he de deleted his Facebook, I'm like dying to delete my Facebook, mostly to stop my mom from posting horrific childhood photos, but I can't because I have to manage, you know, I manage a Facebook account for the nonprofit that I run. Uh, you know what I mean? So you, and because that's where our donors are. And so you, you're sort of, I think if you address those issues through antitrust, through interoperability, you know, if I could communicate on Facebook without actually being on Facebook, I think those issues will free up what is now a pretty serious uh, collection of market power and, and address a lot of these concerns without the need necessarily for congressional action, um, but we'll see. I usually don't like uh, making predictions because I've been wrong about every single political prediction I've made in the last six years. And I don't want to see <laughs> why have, so this would okay. be any, yeah, um, why this would be any different. Um, I don't, I mean, the answer, sorry, I know it's not a satisfying answer, Marshall. I don't know. I, mean, I don't think that there will, I think a lot depends on what happens uh, with the upcoming presidential election uh, and how these companies behave as that campaign heats up. What I will say though is long term, I, I hope that eventually this debate uh, actually moves in a direction uh, that some people have discussed, like uh, Mike Masnick on whether we should talk about protocols, not platforms. I hope that in 200 years, when people are looking at the history of the internet, maybe this will be a time where people said, yeah, there were a couple of these big, powerful companies and everyone had to join these platforms in order to communicate with each other. Uh, but maybe actually the, the long term of the internet is people becoming uh, their own moderators of their own little nodes on what people call a social media environment, and that would be a lot better. Uh, I'm not a technologist. I don't know uh, how uh, soon that future can be realized. Um, but long term, I think we'll eventually view these uh, debates as uh, interesting for people writing PhD theses on the history of this thing called the internet. But uh, long term, I hope that actually the internet is empowering for speech. And um, so I remain optimistic about that. On 230 reform and everything else in, in between, uh, perhaps not so much. Alec. 
Yeah, I think I think the, the safest bet usually ends up being borne out, especially when Congress is in a state of gridlock like it is, is that the status quo will prevail. And I think that's true for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, on Section 230 in particular, uh, like we said, Joe Biden and Donald Trump both want to revoke it, but it's really important to, to note that they want to revoke it for opposite reasons. So Biden wants to see the platforms be mo more aggressive in content moderation, taking down more speech that he and others uh, think is harmful. And Trump wants there to be less content moderation and more of a hands-off approach to content. So I think that at, when their top level goal is like revoke Section 230, um, when they get into the nitty gritty and actually try to write legislation or pass something, those divergent goals uh, in terms of outcomes will, will make that process fall apart. And then on the antitrust side, and I'm really glad Rachel brought this up because my main area I work on for policy is actually antitrust. And I think that while there are multiple ongoing investigations, we've seen the Wall Street Journal report that there will be a, an antitrust case against Google this summer. I think it's really important to note that all the things we talked about here today, I don't think anybody mentioned that a, a big problem facing American society is that digital ad prices are, are too high. Um, and that's really what the cases are going to be about uh, based on early reports. And so all of the things we're discussing here today as, as problems, uh, they're going to try to claim that Google has monopolized the ad tech market. Um, kind of weird because prices have been falling over time, um, while prices for print newspapers have been going up faster than inflation. Um, so on a narrow antitrust, like have these platforms harm consumer welfare, I think they're going to be weak cases that end up getting overturned by the courts if the agencies actually do bring them. Um, but we're going to keep seeing uh, kind of storm and fury about this for the next 12 to 24 months. Yeah, great. So um, pivoting to questions, um, there's some in the chat, but I'm going to start with the question and answer section. Jerry um, actually had a couple questions, but I think his first one sums it up, right? And, and this could go to anyone. Facebook, Twitter, and Google buy out, th buy out threatening competitors. They have a huge mode of money and they purchase anyone who tries to compete with them. How is it possible that anyone could, how is it, I, I think it'd be helpful, because Rachel got to this sort of point. Could you guys just talk out how someone structurally would compete against Facebook or Twitter or anyone in these sort of spaces? Um, is this like a different business model? So maybe you have sort of a subscription-based social media service. Maybe it's more niche focused, right? What would that, if, if you point is if you're a conservative looking at the power that these companies have for good or for ill, how should they be thinking of this space? I'm happy to grab that one, Matthew, if you don't want to. Uh, so I think the most important thing is to take, take recent examples. So the market is not completely static. We have TikTok, which is either number one or number two most downloaded app in the world and in the US um, over the last 12 months or so. It oscillates between number one and number two, um, but it's growing exponentially much faster than the legacy platforms. Um, the Chinese company, which is interesting, uh, and the fact that it has, I think, more than a billion users already. Um, they invested significant capital and marketing expenses to actually get distribution for people to sign up for the app. But at the end of the day, it's just a really well-designed app that does something differently than the incumbents do, which is the short form video content, you know, 30 to 60 second videos that are uploaded by users. So again, it depends on user generated content. I, a lot of my friends use it. It's just really, really good content and a really slick app that gives you a feature that competes on a different dimension than the incumbent platforms do. So Twitter's obviously for a certain kind of thing. Facebook's for a certain kind of thing. LinkedIn's for a certain kind of thing. And they're all competing for attention and their business models are the same and that they compete for digital advertising dollars. But in terms of how users think about them, they're competing on different dimensions. And so the better TikTok becomes, I'll probably just uh, allocate some more of my time towards TikTok away from Facebook. Um, I think that competition on the, on the margin is really important. I guess, uh, I think it's a really good question. Um, I guess my problem with it is, is like, essentially they're saying like, these, these guys have monopolies, it's very obvious. And we're basically telling, you know, if you have a problem with them censoring you, just build your own social social media platform, which is essentially like saying, build your own railroad network. You know, like it, you don't just get to Facebook with over 2 billion users overnight. It's, it, it's not possible for a small shop to do it. Um, the network's built, it's already a monopoly. But the thing is, is that this is not healthy. Censoring people and telling people, okay, conservatives, you go create your own network because the progressives are going to have their network. What that will lead to is a radicalization of America. It's going to lead to a deeper political and ideological divide to where progressives are only talking with progressives. So guess what? Their, their ideas are going to get super crazy and socialist and communist. And then my concern as a social conservative is that by making conservatives only talk to other conservatives, you're going to start having them support really radical stuff that even I don't support. And so I think that the, I, the answer here is to 
have a public forum, have everyone talking together and encourage discourse. Discourage, uh, you know, the sectioning off and the division of America. Otherwise, it's going to get much, much worse. But I think Rachel uh, is probably going to say something much better than me. No, I was just going to, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question, right? Like, we've seen near market competitors either, well, I don't think anyone has actually successfully gotten to be a near market competitor to any of these companies. And if they do, they just get bought out. I mean, Instagram was bought out by Facebook. I think TikTok, um, you know, <laughs> if you want your data to go straight to China, use TikTok. Um, so I think there's a lot of national security questions there that are going to be uh, addressed, I think, from a congressional perspective, possibly, or at least given some oversight. But I think that the point I want to make, too, is that the presence of numerous players in a market is like far from indicating the existence of competition. Um, you know, I see uh, Neil Chilson raising the idea of, of Zoom. Um, so, yeah, maybe there's a competitive marketplace in the meeting app. Uh, that's like maybe 0.0006% of what Google does. Um, Google's dominance over this whole kind of atmosphere is actually what got me interested in tech in the first place. I come from sort of a, a libertarian background. I was Rand Paul's legislative director, uh, worked for Mike Lee, helped write and pass USA Freedom, which ended bulk metadata collection. Surveillance is what got me interested in this from Google. Um, you cannot opt out of Google. Google surveils you wherever they go. And not only that, they're a serial liar about what they do with your data. Um, and there's no meaningful check on that. And I think contra Alec, uh, I do think that there is a strong uh, case that, you know, 50 state and territory attorneys generals are bringing. And if you have Texas and New York agreeing on something, there might be enough smoke that there's a fire. Um, and so I, I think that that's a huge area of concern because that's a compulsory um, you know, area for, for, I think, what's driving a lot of usage of these platforms. I'd, for anyone watching this that's interested in how Google controls the ad tech market, there's a great paper on SSRN called Trust Me, I'm Fair. Um, I encourage you to read it. It has a lot of good data on the ad tech market. But uh, to, to Terry's point, I think it, give me an example of a near-term competitor succeeding over any of these platforms. I'd love to. I think, cause, cause I, and, and, just, and just to Sorry. add to Terry's point real quick, which is just that like, we're talking about speech here, right? So like, I, 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 speech, political speech, like I think people sort of, uh, Rachel may I think made this point earlier, but it's important, like Twitter is where news is. Like news isn't on TikTok, right? So like, I think, we, I think it's important that if we're talking about competitors to Facebook, we, we acknowledge that TikTok isn't exactly doing the same function that Facebook and the public discourse parts were having. Well, today, um, I don't know. Okay, so a couple of things. One, one there's, there's a world of difference between market dominance and a monopoly, all right? Like Starbucks is not a monopoly. Um, and it's true that it's, if you don't like Twitter and you're looking for something else, it's unlikely you're going to find something that has the exact same functions that's as popular as Twitter. Uh, there is gap, but fortunately, a lot of people aren't real fans of white uh, supremacy and conspiracy theories. Um, and actually, like, in this space in particular, actually competing with market incumbents uh, is easier than in a lot of traditional industries. Uh, so yeah, competing for building railway tracks is slightly a different thing. Um, but we are talking about speech. Uh, and I think that raises the interesting point that these companies do change. So you're right, Marshall, to point out that, so TikTok isn't doing the exact kind of thing that Twitter is, uh, but Facebook didn't start out as a, a platform where people would, would share almost literally everything about their lives and organize events and uh, all sorts of things. It started out as a college-based social media thing and it's changed. Uh, TikTok's not gonna be the same. It's gonna change. Um, the, the, the worry here is that if we impose a degree of uh, regulation, whether it's from uh, the traditional lefty uh, antitrust or the more right-wing concern about speech, I worry that we'll see what libertarians always identify as regulatory capture, which is these companies are going to oppose regulations up until the point they view them as inevitable, and then they're going to write them. Uh, and that's going to make them more powerful. And I, I think that's something we should all keep in mind. Yeah, can I um, last yeah, quick please. on this issue? Yeah. So I think there is a distinction between antitrust and regulation and, and the fear of regulatory capture is real. You know, I don't want these companies writing the rules just as much as you know you, you don't. Um, but antitrust is law enforcement. Antitrust is on the books. Um, antitrust is to ensure a fair and free marketplace. Nobody wants to create special antitrust rules for Google. We just want Google to play by the rules that everyone else plays for. So I think that that's just a distinction that I wanted to make. I, th I think there's a good, oh, sorry, Alex, please. Just one quick point. I think an important concept to introduce this conversation that's really relevant in any kind of antitrust discussion is the idea of multi-homing. So the idea of using all these services simultaneously. So I know people, I love seeing like screenshots of people's folders on their smartphones. Like they're like, oh, this is my 
um, video conferencing folder with the 10 different video conferencing apps I use. This is my social networking folder using the 10 different social networking apps I use or my messaging folder. Like users are not a zero sum game. So I use Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Slack, SMS, email. Those are all ways I communicate with people in my network. And many of those businesses all are ad supported. So they can meet, compete in the digital advertising market. But back to Matthew's point about like, is this a monopoly? Or are they just a large business? Um, even Google is the largest um, player in the digital advertising market. They have about 30% of the US market for digital advertising. So, and again, prices have been falling precipitously over the last decade. So in terms of like, is there a consumer harm like antitrust case to be made? It's gonna be really hard to make it on those grounds. And you really have to kind of reimagine what US antitrust law would be to find these companies liable. Yeah, and I, 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 and I think um, to add to a point Terry made earlier, which is that I think part of the issue here is that we are going to have to reimagine how we discuss these topics, right? Like, I think the issue is that I, I think that the discussion about antitrust is solely being about consumer harm. Um, whether or not, like, there is government intervention or not um, is going to require reimagining because, like, once again, like, we'll get the advertising issue, right? So that, that's an issue of that. Like, and, I, and I don't think tech platforms are to blame for the demise of journalism, but when there is sort of like, you know, a accrual of ad tech revenue, it's harder for journalism and for newspapers to actually sell it, like actually exist as a business. So we have to think about the sort of broader things too. Um, and, uh, so Terry, there's actually a, a good last question for you here. Um, and feel free to jump in anyone else. Um, Patrick asks, how do conservatives, and I think this is for you, how do conservatives reconcile the fact that they're will, they're willing to tell people to move to different states to find better policies, but moving to a different platform like Reddit or Gab is a step too far. Um, well, I just first of all, uh, I I don't tell people just to move to different states to find better policies. Although that's that is what my family has done. We just moved from Illinois to Iowa, um, but. We want, look, this is freedom of speech. This is not taxation. This is not, uh, this is, this is deeper than that, right? So, you know, I think it's one thing, you know, if you're, if you're upset with Illinois raising their taxes or, or, uh, you know, raising the property taxes or ruining the schools and spending too much money and going into debt and you're worried about that, you're going to have to move states. But I think that we have to, uh, create the world that we want to live in. And right now we have, we are basically saying to Twitter, and Facebook that they get to determine the rules that the people don't have any right to restrict them. And I, I reject it fundamentally. Just I think that the civil rights law is really important because it says that there are limits to your freedom when it comes to restricting people's uh, ability to get access to restaurants, to, to access to employment and to housing and all of that. And I think that this is the next step here. I don't think that it's constitutional or justified to restrict people uh, who have perfectly acceptable political positions and thoughts uh, that are not obscene, that are not offensive in any way whatsoever. Like the thing is, if Twitter was, you know, actually only restricting racist things or, or, or white supremacist things or, you know, things that actually are bad and we shouldn't let up, I probably wouldn't have a problem with it, but they're, they're not. They're going after people for misgendering things. They're going after people for, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, misgendering people. I want to be very clear about that. But if we're, if we're saying that men and women are different, like this is, it's just weird and it's too much. And we can't, we have to, like at the end of the day, there's a reason why Twitter is caving to the left. And it's because they're afraid that if they, if they don't do all this, that the left's going to come in and regulate them. They're not afraid of conservatives regulating them and using the force of the law. And so I think that if we want them to be honest players, we have to start looking at options to use the law to protect our rights in it. And then we probably won't, once it gets close enough to passing re regulations, uh, they're probably going to come on board and start fixing everything. It's amazing. You saw what happened to, to Facebook after just one uh, uh, or a couple uh, 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 visits from, uh, by Mark Zuckerberg before Congress they're actually coming up with pretty reasonable policies and letting people duke it out and, and, and share their opinions pretty broadly. So um, anyway, um, I, I, I don't even see the correlation there. Uh, I, it's just, it's a totally different world. Well, this has been really great, um, everyone. Um, everyone has way more to add, obviously, but this is not the last we'll be hearing on this topic. So thank you um, to the participants. Thank you for the questions. And most importantly, thank you, you guys for uh, joining this for us. Um, really, really enjoyed this. Thanks, Thanks guys.
Take care.